Welcome back to another episode of the Development by David podcast. This week, your sponsor is me. If you wish to help caffeinate this podcast, then you can use the link in my bio at buymeacoffee.com to supply me with a coffee or two or three. Depends how generous you feel. This podcast takes a lot of work, a lot of energy, and that's supplied by my caffeine intake. And if you wish to support the podcast, then please donate me a coffee. Welcome to the Development by David podcast, Paul. It's so weird saying that because this is your studio and your couch. <laughs> yeah, like, mate. welcome to your own I couch, have, mate. I have never sat here. Have you not? No. Not for one? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit weird. Well, welcome to that one spot of the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, when, you know, contemplating the direction of this podcast, I was just reflecting on my whole journey, uh, not only in the studio, but with the, with the podcast as, as a whole. And it's it's weird because I have either friends that I've made because of the podcast who have been guests and friends or vice versa have had mm-hmm. friends who then came onto the podcast. But like you're this weird hybrid <laughs> <laughs> of both. Like you produce the podcast, you're a mate because of the podcast and I was introduced to you because I have a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just wondering, like how many mates have you made through just having this? Um, uncountable, I think. <laughs> Endless numbers of, uh, well... There's there's a few like you that are like you know that I would get you to come in and sit without there being any sort of business talk. Then there's a so that would say that in that maybe say ten of that group. Then there's like the people that I'm sort of like I wouldn't really go for a beer. Business only. Well, aye. <laughs> And I'll let them guess who that is. Right? <laughs> Aaron Connell's going to be like, but one am I? He's definitely one of the ones that would get in without business. Like, I love Dom. Um, but um, I don't think I've ever met anybody that I don't like. So as much as I'm saying that it's business only, that's because there's just a lack of common ground. It's not that I don't like them. How many episodes of Rebel City have you produced? Like 200? No, man. Uh, we did... Well, unfortunately, the nature of being self-employed, but we did 100 episodes. I think we did 100th episode during lockdown. We're only at 130 or something. That's still a lot, though. Like, what makes you continue to do that despite producing so many as part of, like, your day job? Like, do you... Are you not fed up with podcasts? Or at least doing it? Yeah, no. No, I don't think so. What was it that keeps you around doing it, then? Do you think? Well, it helps with the therapy. I know we'll go on to this later. But I get to sit there and listen yeah. for like, a, be, not not just participate, which is different, but listen to a conversation and be like, try and figure out where people's mindsets are at. Helps me with that. And I got a lot of enjoyment out of just sitting and breathing and just thinking about like, hmm. Uh, and I actually really enjoy it when I don't agree with people. I think this is something that I've had to work on with this being a business, there's been a couple of times people have come in and I've disagreed quite heavily and I've made that known maybe before or after a recording and now I'm just like, that's pointless. <laughs> but what I do do is I have the I have the discussion in my mind. Like I'll be like, where, where, where do I stand in this issue? Where, where do I see their flaws? But I don't need to impose that on other people for me to get what I want for that sort of analysis of where their minds are. That's, that's fascinating. I think it's about time we like dive into your story now because i want to see right. how that intertwines throughout your story mm-hmm. so for the listeners sake who's like who's paul today in 2022 you, you don't just wear the podcast and you, like you're one of the most multifaceted people i know so who's paul today in oh, 2022 very much. <laughs> so uh i had i have basically two full-time jobs like because they both take up so much of my time um but i'm a uh what you could say a cognitive behavioral therapist but i don't do cbt i do an integrative therapy that is a person-centered therapeutic approach that takes from different arms and um, so uh i'm a but i am a bacpp accredited cognitive behavioral therapist and practitioner of emdr i'm an accph senior member so that they're just basically a, that they're accreditations and associations similar to like a chartered surveyor you know you need to keep up cpd and and all, and all that they're just basically like for that but 
I do that. That is basically my passion in life. That is what I want to do. And I use the podcast studio as a way to supplement that. So I've got another full-time job, which is, you know, doing this, um, which is audio-visual engineering. And then on the backside of that, I've managed to fall upon stand-up comedians. <laughs> so like live shows, which is also audio-visual, but also I do a bit of content creation. I've done some YouTube. I do a lot of TikToks. <laughs> I make a lot of TikToks for people. So that's who I am in 2022. But the road to this point has been like, I mean, the Beatles song, The Long and Winding Road, <laughs> has definitely been that. I feel like when I, I talk to people or I tell people my story, they must be thinking, there is no way. You know, You're like a cat. You've lived like nine lives. Yeah. I've had so many different lives. I've tried many different sort of things. Um, well, that, so. that's why as soon as you said to me, to, uh, when, we, when I first came in here, I always said to you I wanted you on the podcast. And I was looking out for guests. Um, and you said, David, I'll come on the podcast. And I was like, hooray! Because mm-hmm. the amount of times I've came in here, and no matter what me and the guests are talking about, or me and you're talking about, you always have a story to tell on that. And I've heard like parts of your story and different jigsaw pieces, but I've never had it together in one go. And being your mate, as soon as you said offered to come on the podcast, not only for my like a listener's perspective, I thought it'd be so valuable to them. I thought I actually want to hear your story from yeah. front to scratch. That's so. nice to hear. It's one of the most common things that I actually get when people come in is they'll go, I would like to get you on as a guest. I, I've resisted the temptation other and I'm sure we'll get to like straight white whale and, and, and what's happened with producer Paul as people started to call me. Which goes well, so I'm like, right, cool. So I'm just being producer Paul. Um, I actually had a weird situation at the stand where I went up to the bar and asked for a pint and the guy went, how do I know you? And I was like, I don't know, mate. And it was the guy next to him went, are you producer Paul on Straight White Whale? <laughs> and I was like, fuck. And they, they recognised my voice. It was the first time that that, I mean, I've had people come up to me and be like, oh, Rebel City and stuff like that, but I've never had... I've never had it that random and also just my voice because I don't go on camera. But it's almost like that, um, I don't want to shit where I eat. Mm. So this is my mindset, is that you? I don't want to have to charge people to come in and interview me. <laughs> you know, like when we agreed to do this, I was like, let's do it remote. And I, because, said, you know. and I said no because I think your story and how well we get on deserves like this kind of physical space mm-hmm. because I think your story is quite deep as well um so as soon as you said that i was like no i would rather come in was there a specific reason to why you want to come on this podcast and share your story or you were more open to it um no (laughs) i just thought fuck it you know like you've i I remembered that you'd asked me before and i just thought oh well fuck it i'll just do it why (laughs) not well let's take it back where were you brought up what was your kind of household dynamic like? Oh, I mean, I was brought up in, um, so it's it's not a very well known housing scheme, but it's um, wedged between two legendary, notorious housing schemes. So I grew up in Carntine. Carntine's like in between Parkhead and Easter House, right, okay. but wedged in between a sort of triangle of like Parkhead, Cran Hill, and Black Hill. And Ridry, so like Black Hills where Arthur Thompson, that was a horrible place when I was growing up in the nineties. Cran Hill, I mean, disgustingly bad place when, when I was growing up. And Parkhead, no much better other than you know Celtic Park, <laughs> which you know it's part of my makeup. But I grew up um, kind of brutally working class, um, you know, like benefits, heroin. Known, known me, you know, I've never tried heroin, but surrounded by it, and um, poverty, and really, I'd, I, I've reflected on it so many times, but it was a fight for survival, like, no doubt about it. I know guys that are dead, you know, I could tell you 10 guys that I grew up with that are just no here, like, died through different things, but ultimately, I think, just their class got them you know like thinking about a guy andrew we called puff mate this guy was one of the best football players i've ever met in my life he played for celtic boys at the time but dad was an alcoholic mum was dead um big sister was a heroin addict died a heroin overdose 
So that was a guy that I spent a lot of time with. You know, like my best mate came through secondary school, drowned in a puddle, like steaming drunk at 17 and fell. Nobody there. And really? I, he was like my best mate. I went, stayed overnight. Weekends, he came to mine for like that, for probably S1, S3. And then he left school. Um, and then I just heard randomly for like his cousin, like, oh no, I'm mixed deep. And I'm just like, what? You know, I'm like 17. Like, what? There's, there's these guys in, in the scheme that had sort of like succumbed to their addictions or whatever. You could kind of see it, but with that guy, I just didn't see it coming. So that that's kind of like the basic makeup of where I grew up. But I think the defining aspect in my upbringing was kind of violence um, in the sense that I was never a violent person. Mm. I hated violence. Like when I think back to being like a really, really wee boy, like my first memories, I liked playing with my sister and playing with our dolls. And I liked just being with my granny. So like that type of like just a, a wee boy. I loved music. I always loved music to like the day that I can remember. I'd be singing along to the, the radio and stuff like that. But I was like that that idea of a like a fight for survival was I had to fight, you know, like I've I've mentioned this many times on many podcasts, but one of the most defining moments in my life was there was a guy, I won't name him, and he basically threatened to barter me and I was like walking home from school and I ran in the house because I was scared of him because he was notorious, he had a reputation. Um he would carry knives. I mean, I carried a knife at one point in time, um, which I suppose if, if you've got a question about that, we can talk about it. Very set, very brief, right? But <laughs> I definitely carried weapons um, at different points in my life. and But this guy um, threatened to barter me and I, I ran in the house and in my panic, I slammed the front door. Um, my dad uh, suffered from chronic heart disease. That's what ended up like taking his life um, when he was young, but he was always in the house. And he heard that door slam and he was like, what's wrong? And I was like, oh my God, because no matter how many people that I met outside the house, the, the scariest person I ever met was my dad and one of the most violent people that I've ever met, but not towards me, towards other people. And I've got a couple of stories that we could talk about if you want to know about how, like what I mean by that. But he basically dragged me outside and was like, if you don't go out there and, and do him, I'm going to do you. And I'm like... 12. Mm. So I have the fear that uh, that I blacked out. But what I did was is I ran down a hill and launched myself. I'm not a wee guy. And, uh, and this guy was small. He was a small guy, but notorious. And I launched myself over a hedge and literally headbutted him like midair and then started smashing his head off the ground. And then just sort of came to with my dad being like, that's enough. So I blacked out, totally blacked out in a panic because I was so scared of the guy and so scared. Of, <laughs> it was basically like, what do I do here? And I think like animalistic instincts just kind of took over. But then what happened after that was I felt sick about what I did to that guy. So that sort of pattern is what then kind of took into my life is I would get into confrontations with people. You need to do something about it. I would do something about it, but then I'd feel so sick and so sad. I used to go, I remember one time fighting with a guy, breaking his nose, and everybody being like, yes! And I walked around the corner laughing, and see, as soon as I took the corner, I just burst into tears because I was just like, I can't believe I've hurt somebody. I never wanted to do that. It's like the worst thing that I could do. And I'm very, and I think that now when I think about my journey and, and I think about where I've came in therapy, I think I've always been very empathetic. Like the, the times where I've hit people, I've got like imprints of their faces, you know, that sort of scarred me almost, you know what I mean? It, it, and from what I know of you and what I've heard from you, you're, you've described yourself as a very imaginative person. Like you, you can see things unfold very vividly in your, in your yeah. brain. Do you think that has, were you always like that as a child or do you think it's because you've had such intense experience as a child that's created that ability? No, it's always been that. I've got memories of sitting in the dark and being able to see things that I'm imagining, like people, like um, people that had died, or I could, I could make them say stuff to me, like a weird, 
weird thing, but it's just your imagination. So yeah. I could almost like just shut my eyes and just see people's faces. Um, so I've always had that. I've always had a vivid, vivid imagination. When I was really young, I was a huge liar. I'd lie about everything. Um, mainly because, you know, dad, we had a bad heart and I had not a lot of money kicking about in the household. So I would feel kind of like maybe a bit uh, insecure. And I'd come up with these stories like I don't, nothing malicious, but just stupid shit. Like um, I remember getting put, pulled into class in primary two and I had wrote, remember news? Your news book? Yeah, Did you yeah, have that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm a lot older than you. No, 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 no. Right, no. so we had like a book where every morning you would write a piece of news for the, the night before or over the weekend. Oh, no, and I, I wrote this story about how I get steaming with my dad <laughs> in primary two. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they were like, pulled me in. I mean, I think if that was nowadays, my mom and dad would have been up at social services. But back then, this is like the 80s, right? I was born in 83. So um, it was like, uh, <laughs> me too. What, did this actually happen? Did this happen, Paul? I wrote another one in news where it was like, oh, my mum and dad have bought a castle <laughs> and um, my dad's got a Porsche. These were the t- it was that type of stuff. I'm not talking about like I spread rumours about other people or any bullshit. Like, nothing like that. It was always about me. It was always about like, oh, I get the new Celtic top. Where is it? Bring it in. No, I'm not allowed to bring it in. Yeah, it's shit like that. And you're a little wee boy. That was because I could imagine what I wanted, but I didn't have it. So I would almost like be... You know, if people were to look back then, be like you were manifesting or, or whatever. But I would, <laughs> the things that I wanted for myself, I would say to people that I had. You know what? That's unlocked like a memory in me. Similarly, I have come of, come from a very similar back- background to you. I used to go on holiday and we had smartphones at the time. I used to go on holiday on the. Um... <laughs> you were a kid and you had a smartphone. <laughs> I was a kid and had a oh. smartphone. I went. Uh... <laughs> no, I wasn't a kid. I was maybe like 15, 16, right? right so okay. in school. And we used to go the nine pound ninety nine sun holidays. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we I went to like that. Weymouth Bay and we went to um a Haven in Berwick upon Tweed. And Berwick upon Tweed's quite scenic, like it's got a beach there. And I remember I used to take pictures of the beach and say I was in Malta and Cyprus <laughs> and, right. and because these were two places that people I, I I knew didn't go. So I didn't I didn't pick Spain, I didn't pick um Portugal or Italy. Right. I picked Cyprus and Malta because I, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. Um I had no mates that had been to these places and I remember I randomly bumped into someone's school and I went to Malta and they asked me where, where I had been and I could not answer. Uh, but I remember doing that as well, but being so ashamed of my identity that I had to signal, even to taking crisps to school, right? I would beg my mum and dad to get Walker's crisps opposed to like, like the kind Asta's of, own brand yeah, the maize crisps right. that you would uh-huh, get, uh-huh. Um, just to signal to other people that things at home were all right. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. because, it, because they weren't. And I used to eat my lunch under the stairs as well. I didn't make mates because I was too scared to expose myself to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to get caught out, and it's weird because I, I, I'm, I'm wondering how you talk about like your relationship with your dad, this kind of fight for survival, working class story. Was that common back then? More common than than, than now because I, I often reflect when I hear stories like that and think, oh, everyone's life was like that back in the eighties, but. <sighs> People had it worse. Yeah. Fuck. Dude. I know fa- I could tell you families where they just let their kids roam the streets at night. So people had it way worse. But people had it better as yeah. well. Um I think that the bit that sort of I define it was I was forced to fight. I mean, loads of people wanted to fight. People would fight. And fights were daily in school. I would fight. I would get into some sort of fight almost on a daily basis. So you get sort of hyper normalized to a bit of violence, and you're right, it is like that. But everything that I'm telling you has been sort of figured out on reflection. So it was normal, absolutely. Like then, as I came into my teenage years, you were like going and looking for the fights, and you're like trying to show off to your mates and being like, who are they fucking talking to? And let's go and get them and stuff like that. And then, and, and also gang fought. Um, like proper like scheme versus scheme in the middle of a park you would meet and shit would happen uh, and again guys died <laughs> doing that guys that were older than me so I remember the older ones that had it worse you know that it was way more violent for them than it was for me when my dad used to tell me stories about him growing up in Duke Street in the 50s and 60s it was like holy shit they I have it easy yeah. but it's on reflection where you're like who, who am I and you look back and you start to go fuck that wasn't good 
and I and I never enjoyed it. And and you lived in fight or flight. It was a constant state of what is going on, looking over your shoulder, skeptical of what people would say to you. Um, just the threat of violence was just ever present, and that was no matter where you went, um, school, walking home for school, at the gates, mate. Tell you a story. Uh, a guy that I went to school with battered another guy that I went to school with who had been semi-paralyzed in primary school. So I don't know what happened. I can't remember, but he, he had a bad accident that meant he was in a wheelchair for two years and then he, he had like a block of wood in between his knees and he walked about like that. And then he was on crutches, walking sticks, and then eventually he could walk. But I think his family were very protective of him because of what had happened in this this guy bartered him in the toilets, right? This guy's uncle came down to our school with a sword. <laughs> and the teachers held the door open for him as he like walked through the school looking for a pupil. And I swear that happened. No way. And we were laughing. So when I look back at that event, we were we were howling laughing. And it was normal. Like, is it, it wasn't it normal. Not- it was abnormal to for somebody <laughs> to be walking through your school with a sword, right? But in the grander scheme of like what was going on round about, yeah, it was pretty fucking normal. Like, and and we found it funny. Um, I don't think we would have found it funny if he'd have caught the guy and done something. But that's an extreme thing to happen. Um, but that was in school. We were in school. Given that the kind of circumstances were fight for your survival, and your dad empowered you and forced you to fight. Do you think? What do you think his intentions were? Do you think it was just my son needs to survive? Yeah, he tried to, I think he did a bit of what, and by the way, my my dad is the reason why I'm the person that I'm the day. I've spoke more about him on podcasts, the stories, like some of the shit that he did. Um, you'd just be like, that's wild, right? Um, but uh, he's the reason that I'm the person that I'm, like, and I mean that in the sense that he was born in the 40s, and he was venomously anti-homophobic, which was not normal. So he would say to me, how do you think that feels? My cousin's gay. And my cousin came out as gay when maybe I was about 12. Uh, and I can remember being told. I get told on Christmas Eve. Uh, and I was sitting, I was spoiled as well as poor, which is a weird combination, I think. <laughs> so they, 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 they gave me everything that they could, but and spoiled me within their means, but to me, looking at other people, I was like, I want more. Like, it was, but I appreciated it. It was, it was like they saved up for Christmases and birthdays type 100%, thing. hundred percent, mate. Provident checks, like the Provy woman coming to the yeah, door, taking out loans, catalogues to get me, my sister, the Burgos, and, and whatever, the Mega Drive, and the Super Nintendo. I got everything, really. But it was the other things, like the holidays, the game, like when I was really young, games of football, football strips. Couldn't afford it, right? But, um, Sure. So he's the per- he's made me he made me the person I am, um, and I'm thankful for a lot of it. The bit that I'm not particularly thankful for is that there's a percentage of my dad raised me on his life experience. So his dad died when he was thirteen, and he got told at thirteen, "You need to go and get a job." So that's the world that my dad grew up in. He worked in a coal van, lifting sacks of coal, um, and then. He graduated to working in a pub. No, right. Think about a 19 year old guy. So, what would that be? Uh, 2065. So, 1964, my dad's working in a pub in Brighton. You need to be hard as fuck, mate. <laughs> and my dad was hard as fucking nails. Like, he took no prisoners ever, man. Like, it, it was just it, his thing with me was like, hit first, hit hard. Don't let people get the jump on you. All this stuff, like, people take advantage of you. But he raised me on his idea of life. Yeah, perception of the world, yeah. Not on where I was in 1995 and <laughs> 1996 as, like, a fucking 12 and 13-year-old. I, I was, like... So I, I get sort of toughened up, in a sense. Um, but I was I was like my mum. Like, my mum's family were very, like, kind of laid back. Um, and my uncle, when I look at my uncles, you know, like they were all very chill and not very violent. And so I think I was more like that. And he tried to make me more like him. But that's the part that I don't really thank him for is that he, I've had to unwind this sort of like, 
fight or flight survival instinct that was kind of like bred into me. There's so many parallels between your story and my story. And one of the questions I want to ask is when you were going through the motions of that, did you have some sort of ambient sense of rage towards your dad because you were kind of forced through this pathway that you didn't feel was natural for you, but no, I idolized, of you? I idolized him. He could do no wrong. So it was like the opposite of that. I was like, fuck this guy. This is what I want to be. Like, I, I, I bought into the sort of toxic masculinity at all. Like, you need to do this and you need to... Basically, like, my dad kind of taught me how to dominate people, in a sense. Um, how, And I observed that. He never, like, sat me down and was like, this is how you do it. I watched him do it to people. I watched him dominate over people. He'd say stuff... He would do stuff like... Um, have... I remember this one, um, it was one of my uncles, um, and he owed my mum money, and basically my mum's a wee bit of a pushover, so uh, it's her brother, he came in and he was like, look, I'm not going to have that money to next week, and my mum was like, oh, it's all right, and I just watched my dad just go and stand over him and be like, go and get that fucking money, and the guy was like, oh my god, like, <gasps> you know what my dad was like, I'm fucking... I'll take this money out on you if you don't go and get me that right fucking now. And he was just like, Gross. like, and but I, I witnessed how he did it. He stood over them. He dominated them. He dominated people. Um, he did it also with this sort of like calm sense of like, I'm not angry. I'm just going to tell you how this is going to go if you take the piss. See, like that sort of stuff. So we moved into a new house when I was like, um, I thought, I, I actually said to my mum recently, I think I was about 11, and she was like, no, you were like 8 or 9. So I thought I was a wee bit older, but he took me along and chapped the door to the guy that stayed upstairs. This is the first thing, right? He met the guy and he went, how are you doing? I'm your new neighbour. I'm Ian. The guy was like, I'm Shook his hand and he went, that's my son. See, if you've got a fucking problem with him, you don't fucking utter one word to him. You come, you speak to me. <laughs> and the guy was just like, oh, okay. And he went, the same goes for the house. Too much noise. Come, you speak to me. You don't talk to my fucking wife. You don't talk to my kids. You deal with me because we're men. And if we need to deal with something, we'll fucking deal with it. Is that all right? And the guy was like, fine with me. <laughs> and my dad went, right, we'll go on then. And it was all very calm. None of it was like intimidating. Like, see the way that you would imagine you would intimidate somebody, like, you know, shout and blah, blah. None of that. It was all very, like, very calm. Um, it was like contractual. Oh, Bit and, and controlled, which I think freaks people out. So my dad, like I said, he was quite a violent guy. His weapon of choice was like a tomahawk axe. Really? So that's what he would use if he'd get any fights or he had to deal with something. And it didn't happen often because he had a reputation. Um, and actually, when I think about it, one of the reasons why I idolized him was See, when we used to go back to like Duke Street where he grew up, everybody was like, people would fucking line a puddle. They let him walk out. Big Ian, do you want a pint? Oh, there's. And guys would say to me, Do you know how lucky you are to have him as a dad? Like, mm. you got up to all sorts of shit that I've no even idea. I've got a couple of points of reference for it, but I don't really know the 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 depths of it. Like, people were like scared of him. I seen fear when people like, met him. So, um, we were moving into this new house, right? And it's like the summer. It's like a summer. I remember it being absolutely scorching hot. And another thing that my dad taught me that ugh, I'm sort of like, mm, was I would do all the fucking work, right? So it would be like me and him. So I'm like, again, we're moving into this new house. I'm like nine. He's got me decorating the fucking house. And he's shouting at me if I do it wrong. Like wallpapering, right. everything. Like not allowed to like... No splatters of paint on the... Uh, right, I uh, can see that you know that, right? It's, it's sort of poverty, right? It's poor. If they could afford to get somebody to do it, they'd do it. But I'm like... <laughs> I'm I'm like a handyman, right? I helped them build every bit of furniture and fix pipes and, and all sorts of stuff, which I think leads on to why I'm so capable as an adult to figure shit out. Yeah. Because, like, you know, like, with tech, and I'm just like, I'll figure it out. If it's something, I'll figure it out, right? I think that's because of... The, um, the way that he, he raised me in that regard, but we're moving into this house and we're decorating it, and it's the day of the FA Cup final. I can totally fucking remember it. Um, and it, we'll get this wee portable TV, and we're watching the FA Cup final, and there's these three junkies, 
and I hate that word, but it's the only way to describe them. That's how we described them back then, right? So there were three housebreaking, notorious housebreakers, which was another thing about the scheme was is that your house would get broken into. Like, the guy next door to me get, would get broken into weekly, mate. Really? Ah, oh, fuck I Like, my cousins, but guess what? We never get fucking broken into. And here's why, right? Because this <laughs> is a standard that my dad would set for himself was, he was like... And I was like, what is that? And he's like, nothing. Stay here. And I'm like, mm. you know, started to get a bit worried. What are you doing? He'd be like, shut the fuck up. Wait here. He went out the back door, jumped over like gardens, came down behind these guys with his tomahawk and walked up behind them and went, boo. And the, I, I saw him watching this as like a wee guy. So he went, boo, behind them. And they went, um, two of them ran away. And the main guy grabbed him and just stood him and was just like, that's my house. You or any of your mate, you go and tell this to every one of them in this fucking scheme. They came near my house, they're getting this. And then just fucking clanged the guy in the face with it. Probably broke his nose, just gave him, a, as, he, as my dad said, just touched him. <laughs> right, but just gave him a bump. And then that guy would have went and went, don't get near that fucking house. Like, that guy's scary. And they probably knew who he was as well, to be, to be honest, because they had a reputation. So that's the type of stuff I'm talking about where I'm saying he, he's violent, but it was always about like, he never, I never ever heard a story from anybody where he antagonized somebody. He was always like the strong silent type. He would sit silently and he would wait for people to push him and then he would react. It's, do you know what I find so fascinating? Like I asked you when we opened up the podcast, who are you today in 2022? And it was a very clean, polished, admirable uh, description and you wouldn't really lace that to like your upbringing that we've just heard was there a point in your story like given the fact that your dad was so idolized and you could watch that vicariously um was there a point in your story where you did something you thought i'm just like my dad i've ticked that box people would say that to me and, and i never felt it um um let me think about it because i tried to be him played football the way that he would tell me to play football. I played the same position in the park. I want to be that. No many people wanted to be a centre-half. I wanted to be a centre-half because my dad was a centre-half and I was tall, so it sort of played to my strengths. Um, nah, mm. don't think so. I, I was always smarter. I always had that sort of sense of, like, I'm a step ahead here, even even him. Like, when I became a teenager, I started to sort of... I remember saying this on a podcast. There was a... Or maybe it was just a conversation. There was a point in my life where I realized I'm smarter than this man. And it was kind of shocking to me. If you, if you, do you know what I mean? He, he bluffed his way through something. And I was like, oh, he doesn't actually know what he's talking about here. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. You know, like maybe this assured, confident guy that, you know, he held court with people at parties and he was always the centre of the attention. He would always, like, put himself there and, like, maybe, you know, I, I, I just got this doubt, like, a sort of hint of doubt where I was like, ah, and then uh, even at, like, 10, 11, he couldn't help me with homework. I was like, right, I'm, I, I'm, I'm smarter in, like, a sort of academic sense, um, but I don't think I ever matched the street the sort of street sense of it and like um what's the other thing that i've maybe inherited from i have got i'm so attuned to danger it's wild like i can see shit coming for a mile away see any fight that's ever happened i've always been like something's gonna go down here i just know it i can feel it i can feel an atmosphere and if i walk into a room as well i can sense what the fuck's going on without anybody even really talking to me i used to hate the phrase gut instinct mm -hmm. i used to think it was just this kind of phenomenon that doesn't exist but then i realize it's just based on patterns that you've seen unfold so you've probably seen so much that you're so hyper aware of what could happen and when it's going to happen and who's going to do it yeah so you get the obvious danger right which is the wee guy and then i've seen this so many times just being a guy at six five i've always been i've always attracted the wee guy syndrome you know and, and that was something that my dad would warn me about he would be like we guys are going to pick on you they're not going to like you and he would also say to me there's going to be people that don't like you he's like you're, you're tall you're smart and i'd be like oh shut up and he'd be like no but listen in terms of you know where we are like you're capable you're smart like people are not going to like that 
and people will probably dislike you just because of who you are and stuff like that, which kind of has came true. But also, um, I think because of that, I have went through, you know, I, I never learned how to be charming. And if people don't like me, I'm a bit marmite. I'm not charming. But if people take to me, I get the same sort of reaction that you're like, I'd love to speak to you on a podcast. Or I'd really love to hear more for you. So I kind of like fall into like a sort of marmite type thing. But what I, what I was saying there is you get the obvious danger, which is the guy that is sitting there going, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And you better fucking watch yourself. But then you get the type of danger that was my dad, who would be sitting there and saying nothing. And he would always say to me, if you're in a situation where there's a group of men, pay close attention to the guy that's sitting saying nothing because he's the real dangerous one. So see the one that's flapping his mouth off? Forget him. And he used to say, if, if a scuffle breaks out, he's like, go straight for the guy that's saying nothing because he'll be the one that they're all scared of. And if you take him, the rest of them will be like, nope. nope, nope, nope. And that's worked out a couple of times for me as well, like in certain situations where, not violently, but I'll I'll think... And this is something in my past that I've really worked on and really get ready, where I would be like, who's the big dick in this room? And I'd be like, I'm coming for him. And I'll belittle them. So they would say stuff, and I wouldn't give them an inch. I'd be like, that's not right. So even in a social context or like a business context, or like, is that unfolded? No, not in a business context. Because, well, I in a career context, uh, and, and I could tell you an interesting story about how dominated people in like a sales floor because i i worked in um we'll go through the story right we'll do it in chronological order but i worked in virgin media um and i was a sales guy as they launched a retail and actually launched as a business um and yeah, i dominated that environment and I, I can tell you how i did it it was very deliberate <laughs> um with the people that were close to me um going about me so but in that sense of what you're talking about where um in a social sense it was unconscious i didn't think I was bullying people. It was just more what I seen for him and applied. You know, it was it was the conditioning of him going, be careful of this, watch for this, watch for that. I would just naturally do it. I never I never really went into these situations and thought, I'm gonna blah blah blah. That came later. That came later as like my went to uni and my horizons expanded. I started to become conscious of what I was doing. It's weird how not weird, but Parents always say, do as I say, know what I do. Oh, but... mate, that was my dad's line. Was like, I don't, I want you to be the opposite of me. But then he taught me everything. Like, that, but he would always be like, that was his thing. He, he would say, you don't do as I do, you do as I tell you to do. And that was something that really, um, hypocrisy is one of my fucking all time bugbears. And I think it comes for that because I grew up in a household where. There was a hypocrisy, like he could do and say he was the king of the castle and I could do fuck all. Like I wasn't allowed I wasn't allowed that. My dad would, would do so I mean I mean that like at sixteen. And this is where I, I look back at this and I'm like, this wasn't good either for the flight the fight or flight response. Um one Friday night I'd be allowed to come in when you like. You know, I would need to go in and go, when can I come in? Meaning like what time am I allowed to stay out with my pals? And he would be like, Whenever you like. Great. See you the next Friday. He'd be like, come in for nine. And I'd be like, what? And he'd be like, don't fucking question me. And I didn't get an answer. Why? Because I say so. So it's a way I can, it's a hostile environment, really. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know what to expect. And it create it created a, a very, very insecure person, like really and truly, that had a, a, a mask of this super secure person, this super confident guy. Went into play music, being on stage, none of it phased me. But really, when, I, when you think about it like that, it was really uncertain. I didn't know sometimes, and and he had multiple strokes. I don't know if this played into it. Um, you didn't know what you would be walking into. Some my sisters spoke to me about this. She was like, it was the same for me. Some nights you would walk in and he'd be like, oh, how are you doing? How was your night? Sit down to. It. Other nights she would go in and he would just be like in a rage, and just be like, get the fuck out of my sight. And you just didn't know what to expect. So after that kind of childhood to teenage experience, what did you go on to do after that? So I yeah. did exceptionally well at school, um, which um, creates achievement addiction ultimately um, and, and a person um, which I've came to understand only really in the last sort of like five to ten years. 
um, never really knew it was actually a thing. But I was always told you're the smartest. I was the first person, and my um, so the expectation was super duper high. Um, my exam results were exceptional at standard grade. Um, I spent six months of that year with a migraine, which instilled a work ethic into me that I'd never had before because I had to work really fucking hard. So I went for the point of like, you know, you're going to get ones in your standard grades. I mean, you'd have done what, nat fives and stuff like that. Did mm-hmm. you do standard grade? Or? Nat fives. Right, so we did the one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven was like a fail. Uh, I was told all the way, you're going to get ones, you're going to get ones. But then I took a migraine and they were scanning my fucking brain for tumours and all sorts. Like, and it was a, basically a doctor that fucked up because uh, I went to another doctor through my mum and dad being like, we need to take him to another doctor. And it was within five minutes they gave me some tablets and the migraine went away. And I'd been suffering through it for nearly six months. Couldn't see. Vomiting. Lost tunnels of weight. Um, and that was a, a pivotal time. I missed my, my prelims. Mm. I did my prelims in the house. I failed them all. Obviously, I was in pain. Um, and I went back and it was like, I'm going to fucking do something here. Like, I, I, I remember going back and it was uh, an art teacher, Mr. McAvoy, and we had a love-hate relationship because I was great at art, um, and he loved me, but he was like, you're going to do nothing. He was, di- he was so disappointed in my prelim, he, he sort of gave me a bit of a foot up the arse. He did it in a way where he sort of like was like, you're going to fail. I know it. I can see it coming. Uh, and I went, I'll fucking show you. And I showed them, um, and I studied. So it was like relentless like relentless I was like for six months I'm going to fucking do this and I did it and then uh, so I did well I did uh, five hires in fifth year all A's because um, I went to uni at 16 got offered an unconditional place at Glasgow and my dad was like you're too young like you don't want to go there you want to go there and enjoy it you want to be able to go for a pint like you're 16 coming up for 17 I was born in November so I was like the youngest amongst the youngest in my school year and he was like, don't do it. Just go back to you. Go and do a six year. Fuck about. Enjoy yourself. But that was the worst thing. That, well, I'll correct that. Maybe the best thing that ever happened to me because then I, I found hash and I found guitar. And I went, no, I don't. No, I like this. Because I didn't need to do anything. I resat graphics because I'd get accepted into architecture. So I was going to become an architect. That was the original plan. And then... Um, so I resat graphics. I did uh, history, which and I did, a, and then I did music, which I'd never done all the way through. It'd been science, you know, like I did the two sciences. I did two languages: uh, maths, English, graphics, and art. And um, but in that six year, I'd always, like I said, I'd always had that thing me for music. I always sang along with the the radio. I would sit and record the radio. I loved music. I'd a taste of music. Um and in that six year I learned how to play guitar properly. I'd always kind of fucked about. Um, but I learned and I started a band and I found hash. I started smoking hash with this wee guy that I went to school with, he was a bit of a loser. And we'd just go and sit in his house because I didn't have any classes, I had like three subjects. So what does that you know, like three subjects a day? Yeah. So I had like two, three periods or whatever, five periods, or whatever. So Say that's the worst thing that it was the worst thing that happened for my academic career, which I picked back up in my thirties to become a therapist. But it sparked a creative a creativity and music and uh, consciousness expanding began then with like weed and drugs and I get interested in women and alcohol and all the things that, you know, take away <laughs> for what I'd been doing before, which had been football and um academics that was all i really did given your dad was your idol and he gave you that advice to stick on to the sixth year but then you went down this very radically different path after that Mm -hmm. doing something that was very creative and different to what you had been planning for since the year before what was his perception of that was he encouraging he didn't know anything about it other than the guitar and i think when i think back he didn't encourage it so i think he knew i think he was like ah he knew what happens to people that, that that do that, you know, that end up um, 
creatives as well. Like he worked in pubs and bars and clubs. So he knew guys that would come through, good guitar players and blah blah blah. And, and I think he knew, and he wasn't an idiot. He knew I was smoking hash. He knew what hash was. You know what I mean? He was in this fucking scheme. He knew what it was. Um, he could smell it off me. Um, so I think he, I think he was disappointed, but he never ever like, vocalized that. Um, until I told him I was going to leave uni, and then uh, that was that was a bit of a sort of life changing moment for both of us because it was the first time in my life where I sort of pushed him back and went, "I'm too big for this, man. Like you're an old man." At this point, he was he was getting sick, so he died when I was twenty one. Told him I was going to leave uni when I was twenty, so mm. he was he, he was getting sick. He was old. Um, he'd been in a hospital. He was frail as well, um, and. He, he tried to like grab me and like drag me through to like my bedroom to have a word with me and I basically was just like don't fucking try me I was like this isn't happening man like I'm a man and he was like oh if you're such a big fucking man then you can go and get your own place and and, and we ended up in an argument but I think it was a bit of a changing moment for the Perrys because it, I think he realised right I can't bully this guy anymore I'm not, and, I, and I was in a bit a place where I was like I'm not going to fucking allow it either like because um, he didn't have that physical intimidation over me anymore like at that, my dad was six one, super tall for his age but i'm six five and at that point he was probably about like fucking 60 kilo and and i was a big guy like um at, at points in time in my life um fluctuated in weight so at this point i'm probably like 100 110 120 kilo and i was like get your fucking hands off me man like this isn't going to end well for either of the two so that that's when I told him I was going to leave uni. I was planning on leaving uni. Um, the reaction that night made me rethink it, and I did go back for my third year, um, and I did complete. I dragged my fucking ass through uni, and I, and I thought, well, if I've came this far, I may as well get my bachelor's degree, um, which I got. But architectures get like similar to surveying, like professional qualifications. You need to go and be a technician basically make cups of tea and coffee <laughs> and then you do your professional exams it's like a seven to ten year it's not just the average four-year uni so i i managed to get myself through my three years at uni and get my bachelor's then i do my honors year the calculated decision but that was because i decided to dedicate myself to music which i had been doing in the background all the way through uni i'd been playing music in a band since i was 16 that's when i started my first band was in sixth year and I started sixth year in school, sixteen, and I thought, why not? I don't know. I think it was to get women. I think it was <laughs> to get buds. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, fuck it, man, get some buds. Then it worked. You were open about how you, like you, you lost your dad at twenty one. Not to go from uh -huh. one funny subject to like a radically unfunny subject, uh -huh. I guess. Did you lost your dad at twenty one and pursued the music path? When he passed away, did you like hit a crossroads of do I go back? to what I studied and never no no mate I'm very I was doing it it was happening it, 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 we'll talk about that we'll talk about what it was like to fail pretty much for the first time in my life like right being competent is probably it's a gift and a curse um and uh, but never the last thing my dad I'd, I, my dad died on a Wednesday and I was playing gigs so I came back to Glasgow and just like what the fuck like and uh he said to me do not cancel one gig he was like i cannot i was just like don't do it and he was like and i want you to do this so i was like i'm fucking doing this he died on the wednesday night at like 11 o'clock at night and i was on stage on friday saturday night sunday night playing gigs that was what he wanted mm -hmm. I, I i said to my mom like do you want me to cancel his funeral was on the saturday we put his coffin, I'm a Catholic, I was raised a Catholic, we put his coffin into the chapel on the Friday night. I left there, went through to Edinburgh, played a gig, came back through, went to his funeral on the Saturday, came down to Newcastle, played a gig, came back up, played a gig in uh, Glasgow on the Sunday night. But that, I'd, I was cancelling it all, and everybody running about me was like, cancel these gigs. Um, but only him, he was like, don't do it, man. I don't want you to do it. I want you to do it. And I was like, right. And he's like, this means more to you than anything. This is your thing. And I was like, right, cool. And when we came off the stage on the Sunday night in Glasgow, one of my best mates now, 
I say my best mate, like that understates uh, the guy that played drums and pretty much all of my bands, uh, Darren, Darren Gowrie. He's like, he's like my brother. Like, I love that dude. We were out on Saturday night, like we were sitting fucking greeting and slouch cuddling each other, steaming, telling each other how much we love <laughs> each other. And known each other since we were like 17, you know what I mean, nearly 40. So there's a bond there, but his dad, who is, would never give you a compliment, everything was always nitpicked. Mm-hmm. Just was like, I can't believe that you did that. And was just like, that's just like, you're fucking 21. Like, I think even the strength, he was like, that's wild. So I actually was like, I felt good about that. So a, a weird sort of thing. Like, I felt good about the fact that I was like, I, I powered through with that. Um, and I didn't have any guilt or regrets because it was because he asked me to do it. That was the only reason I did it. Otherwise, I'd have cancelled everything. Um, See, now in retrospect, going through, obviously, becoming a qualified therapist, mm-hmm. in retrospect, do you wish you gave yourself that time to grieve properly? Or are you glad in retrospect that you listened to his word and performed? Interesting. I don't think I've ever thought about that. Um, was it ideal circumstances? No. But, you know, like, I think I drank a bottle of Jack Daniels. So I'd like I threw myself into alcohol and drugs. So probably not. Like, so I could have probably still done the gigs and not done that. Right. And um, but it gave me a purpose. So I don't regret it. I actually think that it it made me see that there are bigger things that like than the people that you love. There's a perspective in that where my dad was like I'm dying and I'm old. You're young. Go and do it. Don't sit about and wait. You know, and I think that maybe because he lost his dad at a young age and he was forced into just doing rather than sort of like quantifying or thinking about what's going on. I think he probably seen the value in it and he's just been like, just go and put your energy into that. And like, and I did. I relate to that so much because I was 21 when I lost my mum and my approach was very similar, just leaning into life a little bit more and that might mean bypassing the wallowing feeling of grief i I just accelerated like this podcast came out of my mom dying Mm -hmm. all the things at work came out of my mom dying leaning into other personal endeavors came out of my mom dying and i was wanting to one of my questions for you was what did you learn from that experience like what superpowers did it give you because i say for me grief has been a superpower um it's the, the biggest piece of advice i've given people is that you're able to like gamify immortality. Like I say to my, yeah. I say to my mates, like picture that you were given the news that your parents were going to die in in two weeks, or you were going to get die in two weeks. What would you do? Well, you'd create a bucket list, and these are the things that are mean a lot to you. Memories you've still got to make, friendships you've got to amend, relationships you've got to build. Mm-hmm. You would go and action all those things. But the thing is, we're fortunate usually enough to do those as a part of our everyday. Why don't you do it? And that's one of the things I've learned from losing yeah. my mum. Yeah, um, I think um health like my dad was really unwell he had no real quality of life for a very large part of like his later part of life and um, he couldn't walk to the end of the street because he had angina and it was all heart and respiratory like based illnesses so um i think the, like the the perspective that i got that i've again like retrospectively looked back and sort of like taken is like i want to be healthy i want to be a healthy person like he wasn't um and that was lifestyle i think ultimately um greasy foods dry ups pints worked in pubs you know what i mean so i think like i then after i came through the uh the alcohol and drug binge that happened after he passed away that lasted for maybe about a year or two I, th- I then started to be like, how do I get how do I get fit and healthy here? Because I was starting to get really unfit and really, you know, like not. Were well, you not quite obese at one point? Aye, mate. I was the, my biggest was twenty five stone, but I'm a big guy, right? So people would be like, oh, you carry it well and all that sort of stuff. But no, the the, the fucking what happened was is I got sciatica, like brutal sciatica. And by the way, like I have got a pain tolerance, right? It's like I mean they even. When I went to the physio with my sciatica, they were like, we can't believe, because I, I put up with it for a year with just nothing. I just bared it. Um, the pain was so bad at times, like one time at Tina Park, 
Audio Slave. Remember them? Like the Rage Against the Machine sort of like cover band. I don't know them. They were they they were like Rage Against the Machine without their singer and Chris Cornell. You know that name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mitty Suicide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no so long Soundgarden. Ago. Yeah, Soundgarden. He was the singer and Audio Slave as well. Got a couple of decent tunes, but they were on a team. The park place was packed. Everybody jumped up and down. The pain was so bad in my back, I just sat down and I was getting kicked in the face. None of it was bad enough for me to get up. So after a year, I finally went, I'll go to the doctor. You know, like something that I've fixed subsequently. <laughs> after that, um, I went to the physio and they basically went, this is, this is a tall and fat person problem. And I went, all right. And she went, do you want the bad news? And I was like, what's the bad news? And you went, you're Beth. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but that's brutal. But, that, uh, but it was the truth. That, that was the cold hard truth. She went, you're both tall and fat, and your back is fucked. And she was like, so what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to rehab your back, and you're going to need to lose some fucking weight. And I was like, right, okay. And this is the, the other story of, like, everything that we're, that we're talking about. If I put my mind to something, I can do it. I, and it's not an arrogance to say that. I've just proved it to myself over and over and over again. I rehabbed my back in six weeks. I was just like, what do I need to do? And she was like, do this twice a day. And I was like, cool, I'll do that four times a day. Because I don't want to feel this. I'm going to get rid of this fucking shit. Um, and then I thought, I'm going to just, I, I stayed with my mum in Carntine. So I mo I'd moved out um, and I had a flat um, in the West End. And when my dad died, I was like, you know what, I'm going to move back in with my mum. Because like, she was like an ideal flatmate with all the ships passing in the night with a, with a nice house, three bedroom, like ex council house. And um, I just thought, this is ideal. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't need to pay rent. And like, and I, and I asked her, like, with my dad gone, do you want me to come back? And she was like, I would like that. And I was like, right, fuck it. So I stayed in Carntine. Carntine's probably about, what, somewhere between four and five miles away from the city centre. And I worked in Virgin Megastore. So, is this where still playing in bands? Yeah, so Virgin Megastore were at the time it was a record shop, with mm. CDs, DVDs, games, and they were so accommodating for people that were touring in bands because we're all you're really cool and they'd let you sell your fucking CDs and all that. Like it was class. Was it like the the two thousands version of CEX? <laughs> it was better than that. Oh mate, the parties that we had in this place were, and everybody was into music, and so they were fucking crazy. Everybody was a druggie as well. Like everybody was into you know, pills, coke, because we were all kind of failed or trying to be sort of rock stars, movie makers. It was all like it attracted creatives. Um, there were very few people that were like, I'm here for a career. The people that were doing that were people that had failed in their band or whatever. Excuse me. Um, so it was perfect. You would say to them, you know, I've got a 10 night tour. No bother. You know, so I, I, I went there. Um, and I worked there for three years, maybe a wee bit more, maybe four, but um, started in there part time at uni. But I decided at this point, I, I'd, I'd finished uni at this point, and um, I was like, I'm just going to walk, walk to work and walk home every day. So I did like a ten mile round trip every day for about six months, and in my days off, I'd go to the gym. So it was like twice a week, I'd go to the gym, and then I would walk. 10 miles a day to and from work from Carntine to the city centre and then back again. Not every day. Some days you'd be like, I'm fucked. Like, I'd have a hangover or whatever and you'd be like, I'm going to get the bus home or whatever like that. You need to get a taxi to work. So I'm not saying that was every day, but that was basically how I lost weight. The really rudimentary, no fancy diet. I basically ate three meals a day. I was like, no snacks. I was mad for chocolate, mad for crisps, mad for juice. Started drinking Diet Coke big change for coca-cola to diet coke stopped eating snacks i just had my three meals breakfast lunch dinner and i walked to and from work and i went to the gym my days off and that was it it was no fasting no keto none of this nothing no protein counting no calorie counting i would eat as much bread as i wanted it was nothing fancy about it it was just simple fucking binary just consume less calories move um, and it worked, mate. I went from 25 to about 13 stone in the space of a year. Really? That mm -hmm. much? Yep. The What's weight. that in kilos? What? Fuck knows. 70, 70 plus kilos? Something like that, I think. Aye. Jeez. But there was no no internet, really. There was internet at the time, but it was like Yahoo Pool. 
So there was no like, how do I lose weight? What is the ideal diet? And I think that some of that actually takes away now to just people having like a, a simple energy and pressureless energy. fucking I'm gonna lose some weight and they do it. No, it's like research and blah 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 and, and too much, I think. Too much information's like a killer, I think, for people. But that was how I lost the weight. Um and again, when I put my mind to something, it's just there. Like it just it just happens. Spoke about upbringing, weight loss, academia. Let's talk about the band. Give me some of the experiences that you had touring. What was it like, just more generally? Um, it was a bit of a circus. But ultimately, it was the greatest time in my life. Um, I didn't really feel like that at the time because it was always just more and more and more. Like, you know, we want to get there. We want to make it. What does that mean? Like four guys five guys actually um to the east end uh who you know played all the iconic venues in the uk and festivals and supporting big bands and stuff like that like we made it big time man but just the relativity of it was just lost on me because i was just like i want to be a rock star you know what i mean we're still playing toilets none of it was ever good enough it was just always like why be that big thing but um it was the fucking greatest i mean i was an ampersand for 17 27 so like 10 years right um but the glorious sort of era of that happened between we get a manager at 19 we get an agent at 20 so like between 20 and 23 was just i mean mate, the amount of drugs that i took amount of alcohol that i drank the amount of sex that i had was like half the fucking charts i guess in retrospect you wouldn't have changed that 20 to 23 period would i fuck but i guess at the same <laughs> time you would want to be like you kind of wish you were probably present at the time but you're probably so distracted by the drugs and alcohol and the lifestyle that you didn't take it in well i was present for a lot of it um i didn't really get into the habit of getting fucked up and going on stage until things started to take like a sort of downward trajectory so i would always be like and by the way like see if you want to make like a world leader type analogy of what i was like in a band i was stalin i was a dictator like everything went through me i didn't let any conversations happen i wasn't letting any of the guys speak to a fucking agent a booker it was like like <laughs> no chance they'd have fucked it up that was like my sort of like mindset so i was present for a lot yeah i was very much like in in the pocket in the zone it would be like two drinks before we go on stage and then after that we get fucked like let's get fucked up so i was present for a lot yeah i loved being on stage i loved being the center of attention i loved being like my dad in that sense i would go to these parties with people in other bands other charismatic people and i would dominate conversation i would dominate it'd be about my band like a guy a guy said something to me one time and i was like i don't know if i like that and i've never really thought about this but maybe this is where i started to be like dan they like who i am where um i won't name the band because they actually went on to do pretty well and he was like uh one night I introduced them to Ecstasy, so they were for like a small village in Scotland and they came to Glasgow and I met, I met them through, one of them worked in Virgin Megastore um, and we just took to each other and it was like fucking chalk and cheese, like they grew up in Cernestay and they were all like farmers and money, you know, like that's, that's a rich area, like the golf course, they've all got farms and um, they came and I was just like a scheme, you know, like, so they were like, oh fucking kind of liked me and i gave them their first pills and stuff like that which is a funny story but the guy that was the singer said to me we almost gave up when we met you and i was like what why and he was like we just thought we can't compete with that guy and i and i, and I think when i look back i was kind of like in what way and they were just like oh, fucking just the way that you were and and the I think really that same as that Stephen Round guy, like a certain amount of charisma, it intimidates people, and they'll maybe like, fuck man, I can't, I don't know if I can be like that, and maybe that's what I need to be like. But ultimately, it wasn't because they went on to do bigger and better things than what I did. But I think maybe at that point in time, because that's when the, I remember that being around about the same time when we get dropped 
the agents, labels, management and stuff like that, I started to go, maybe I want to change myself here. Maybe I don't want to be that guy that's, it reminded me too much maybe of my dad and that sort of like, at that time, 27, 28, that's when my I started to have like my mental health issues and, and stuff like that. So um, I, the, the way that I was with people almost made them want to give up. <laughs> a weird thing, but he was saying it in a complimentary manner. It's weird because that character that you described through those years is like the antithesis, the complete opposite of what you are now. Like I would never have thought that was ever you. Mm -hmm. Like how did you unwind that? Well, it was a mask. It was total bravado. I was puffing my chest out and I was faking it all the way through. Oh, that. Didn't ever feel confident. You just wanted to feel important because you probably felt like the underdog as a kid. 100%. 100%. So, it, um, and then it became, I was that, you know, like it was nearly like a mask. It was a mask at first, but then I, I, I truly loved that. I truly loved that sort of like, I'd walk into rooms and I would just eye people up. Um, like I'd walk into parties and people would be like, you'd suck there out of the room. And that sort of like weird way where people would be like, who's that? Now, a lot of that's got to do with just physical stature, you know what I mean? And also quite radically dressed, you know, like would walk about with just like a leather jacket and a, a white vest and skin tight jeans, like, you know, so you looked the part, I had long hair, I'd hair down to like, yeah, I had really long hair, I looked the part, um, I acted the part and it, it was who I was, I wasn't putting on a persona, I wasn't like, you know, like I've met people where you're like, that's a persona, I was at that, that I, I had became that, but my true self, is more like what I am today. I think I've kind of married them together. Like took the best parts of both. Yeah, I think so. I think, and I don't think that's been a conscious thing either. I think that's been unconscious. Where I, through therapy, and uh, I looked back and thought, what was I like when I was really young? We'll go on to therapy because we're, we're we're talking about the music. But we're coming to the tail end of the, the sort of music stuff. As a story, as like a single story. Um. I'll tell a bad one, right? Okay. There's a guy who used to be a best mate and um, he was getting too big for his boots in my eyes. So I had inspired him to want to be in a band. Like he was a guy that I used to go to school with. So I knew this guy through school. I never liked him. I always thought he was a bit of a prick. Um, and then when the band started to go, he randomly just ended up at a party or at a gig. And I was like, all right, man, I'm about to fucking school with you. And we just fucking hit it off. He was just, he was an oi me. It was like, you know, he was like, how have you became, like, you were like this quiet guy in school, just, with, and, and he was just like, wow. And um, he used to copy me. Like, he started buying the same clothes. That kind of pissed me off. I asked him not to do it. I was like, listen, mate, don't copy me. Can I do it? You know, like, this sort of, like, arrogant, like, you'll know me, be yourself. It as well like be something else can it be me was it you know i'm already here and i'm better <laughs> and i'm bigger and you know i well it is kind of funny but he took my advice and he started to sort of be his own person and he joined a band and i helped him create that band he common people that i knew he didn't know i'd be like why don't you get him so people that i met through being in the band i would be like this guy's tr try to start a band but he said to me one night um and obviously my eyes, I was like, he's rang. He was like, I think my band's better than yours. And I just was like, that's a joke. I was like, that's laughable. And I was like, but I think what you like. But that fucking upset me a wee bit, right? And I was like, how fucking dare he? Like, I've helped him put this together. He's been in his band for like three months. I've been doing this for fucking, I think at this point, we're like six years. So we're at a hug me nay party. Um, and I probably took too many drugs and I just thought I'm going to take him down a peg or two and I spat in his face and he went he sat like I, I, I just out of nowhere mate I stood up and I walked across the room and I, I crouched down and I spat right in his face and I went go do something about it I'm begging you to do something about this and he was like and he, did, he was just like he was raging man he was fucking raging and I was like get the fuck out of this party and he just left so 
that I'm I'm not ashamed of that story, but I don't like tell I do have a certain amount of shame, I suppose, associated with it, but it's a reminder of like what I could end up where I could end up if I don't keep myself in sort of like close on, on like not a tight leash, but on some sort of leash and where that sort of like attitude can end up. Like that's not good behaviour. Like I really embarrassed myself firstly and humiliated what was at my at the time one of my best mates um and in front of his girlfriend in front of his bandmates in front of everybody that we thought was important um and at like quarter to midnight and hugged me knee and he left and he was outside himself and people didn't even follow him out which i think hurt him as well because he would be expecting people to be like you're a prick we're going after him and they didn't they sort of like stayed with me another <laughs> sort of story was we played in London, um, just to get, and we can go back to that story about about that guy that spat in his face. We played in London, and the smoking ban had come in in Scot uh, in England, but not in Scotland, right? So there was a time where you could smoke inside. I don't know if you remember that. Um, yeah, but the the joys of a pint and a cigarette inside a pub are lost, right? It's one of life's few p- pleasures. Um, but uh, we went to play the Camden Underworld, in 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 London. Uh, and the gig was sold out and the guy was like user headlining and i was like i don't want a headline because we're coming from scotland put on two good acts they've sold all the tickets like i would rather you put us in the middle and he was like no nah, mate i want to put you on last so i was like Fuck. the band that went on before us were like getting touted as like the new white stripes they were a guy girl duo girl drummer guy they were basically like a carbon copy they'll never go fucking make it and they never did but they were good and they were they had a good following because White Stripes were fucking huge at the time. Um, and they were on stage and the place was sold out, packed to the rafters. And then they came off stage and the place emptied. So I was like, fuck it. Went backstage, snorted a couple of lines, took a couple of pills. And then when we were setting up the gear, people started to come back in for their cigarettes. And I was like, why not? And during the first song, the drugs kicked in. And I don't remember anything about that gig. I played an hour, no memory. And the giggle. Oh, mate, okay. I got a right up in the NME. It was like, fucking, that was great. Really? <laughs> oh, but gee. we just thought the place had emptied because people had went home. Yeah, because and you're used to the smoke. Oh, they yeah, had that went out okay. for a cigarette because of the smoking ban, they couldn't smoke inside. So we all, pretty much to a person, get quite fucked up on drugs at a very important gig in london you know the agents like don't fuck this up there's gotta be press there we thought the place had emptied and then ended up on stage five guys stumbling about falling about um i don't remember any the only bit i remember is kind of looking out and nobody able to see anything in the crowd and going oh fuck fuck this <laughs> but we did well muscle memory kicks in and again going back to the starving thing i made sure we practiced we pra- see every night we won the gigging we we're in the practice room so we did our reps and we did them and i made sure that we fucking did them so if things went wrong people slipped and fell we we could keep going keep going keep going we were drilled we were tight um and that that came down to me because that was my like work ethic of like let's fucking do this like same sort of thing that i got in school um if it had got left to the other guys and they all say this even to this day when we meet up which is kind of seldom, um, other than Darren. Um, they're always like, see, without you, none of that would have happened because you were like the one that was like, no, like we need to do this. And then I was the one that would get the agents to come to the gigs and, and blah, blah, blah. It's nuts how far apart like the CBT work that you do and in your, in your career in the band, how far apart they really seem. Oh. But like the work ethic is like consistent through the entire journey. Yeah, yeah, through lines. I think that everything that I've ever had in my life, I've had to work for. Um, I started doing papers at like nine. I had a milk run at 12. Um, and then I went to McDonald's at 15. Um, and well, I was talking to one of my mates about his son. And he was like, doesn't he want to get a job? And I was like, it's such a weird thing that's happening because I was desperate for that national insurance card to come through the door. Because as soon as you got that, you could go to McDonald's and get a job and get 90 quid a fortnight. And that was like freedom, you know what I mean? And I was doing there straight away, working at McDonald's. And, and then I went, I've never been without a job, mate. See, for nine, I've never not had a job. Jeez. The longest I've ever went without is now. 
that I'm self-employed. <laughs> but I've never, I've never had a period of unemployment. When did you fall into CBT? I don't want to say fall in, but when did you pique your curiosity for CBT? So, I think like this story comes with mental health issues. So when the band, when the band, so we could, yeah. Aye. I was going to say, well, let's talk about that sort of dominating the sales floor type yeah, thing yeah. story, but fuck it, it doesn't matter. We can, we can sort of gloss over the sales career because it isn't really that important to the story. The stopgap of making money and pursuing happiness through material objects, which just never happened. But when the band stopped, um, I never realised it at the time, but my purpose went where, and I threw myself into a job of selling mobile phones and broadband to people. That's what I was doing. So Virgin Megastore became Virgin Mobile because I needed to make a wee bit more money because the band's tour, gigging and touring went down the way, stopped making that extra income, which was pretty little, but it supplemented. So I started, I just looked about and there was a Virgin Mobile concession and Virgin Megastore and I looked at how much money they were making and I went, I'll just do that and I did that. And then they became, Virgin Mobile getting bought by NTL they became Virgin Media, the Virgin Media that it is still to this day that I worked for until 2020. So, um, and I worked for them for 13 years. It was like another lifetime of like fucking career and work. But my purpose with that band and that writing music and chasing agents and sending emails and recording and all that, everything just went. But I didn't really realize it. So I put all of my eggs into, well, I'll just do a career in telecoms and <laughs> fuck me did I should I have done something <laughs> different <laughs> but I made a lot of money like I went from um 10 I mean what was I making in Virgin Megastore 10 12 grand a year to 50k like selling mobile phones and I was good at it mate and I got a lot of sort of joy and I got a lot of gratification on in the days of like closing sales and selling and, and I started being like say, uh, the salesman and let's go out for drinks after work and you know like being very much like bought a house, bought a flat, you know, rented the flat out like right here we go this is going to be what I do. Get my girlfriend, get my house, get, my, get the car, this is it and it brung a sum of fuck all to my life. It made me actually terrified for the future. Is this it? Is this all that, I, you know, three holidays a year, going to Dubai, Vegas, spending extravagant amounts of money in clothes. And I just looked, I, I, like I literally at 31 just looked and went, I don't like any of this. None of this is bringing, make me happy. It's bringing a pressure making me it's make me chase more yeah i'm feeling like it was almost like i had everybody around about me going fucking hell man like i want that all of my mates no making anywhere near the same amount of money as me and um and i, I was just kind of like i don't really want this it was everything 12 year old paul lied about it absolutely was it absolutely was. And, uh, and you finally got it and it wasn't what it, it so, promised yeah, to be. Yeah, mate. Celtic tops would come out and buy all three strips. Season ticket, parkhead, lovely flat, beautiful girlfriend. It was everything that I ever wanted as a teenager. It was absolutely everything minus the actual thing that I want, which is a fucking reason to live. I had no reason to live because what is it? Brands can sell this, right? I hear this in Pure Gym every day, right? And it it does my nothing, right? Come and work at Pure Gym, do the level three course in eight weeks and begin to change people's lives. Like, what are you doing, really? What are you really doing? Like, really and truly, why, are you, why would you do it? You can make money. Like, call a spade a fucking spade, right? I did Virgin and it was all the same stuff. It's the same stuff, right? I, I, I'm using Pure Gym... Maybe as as a as a poor example, because PTs can change lives, right? Hundred percent, I know that for a fact. Um, um, I think it's a shallow puddle of uh, contentment and purpose, but it's at least a 
it's at least got some water in it, which my one had no water in it. Mm-hmm. But brands, business, capitalism, they will be like, you are changing people's lives. You're not really. You're not really, mate. Like, I don't I don't believe I ever changed anybody's life by selling them a broadband package, right? But they would be like, this enables connectivity. You've seen the adverts on the TV. Um, the new iPhone, look at it. It enables all of these things. But I think I, I really did truly know. I knew what the pursuit of actual greatness felt like and what it felt like to be on a path and have a purpose to get up and go and do stuff. And when that went, I started to like really be like, ah, right. What what have I what am I doing with my life? Um, I'm still playing music, but the fire had went went out really. I was still in a band and I enjoyed it, and it and it was recreational. It became recreational, and it became an outlet for creativity. I still wrote music, but it it lacked the purpose. It lacked that real sort of grit and to ter- and determination that you when the chips go down which they did during the years being in the band, you, you've always got, but wait a minute, I've got this thing that I'm trying to do. This grand vision. And it's be- it's bigger than me. And it involves five other people and I'm doing it for them as well as me. And then there's people that come to the gigs and then they're around me. You, you know, like within the band, there was probably like a, a circle of closeness within about 100 people that were like um, within the machine of the band and the close crowd that were there for the start and there at the end. You know what I love about your story, Paul, is that people might have heard different flavours of that story. For example, the example I think of is UFC fighters who are way past their heyday or boxers that are way past their heyday coming back to try and fight again. Yeah. And they get Mm -hmm. leathered. And I think some people like, uh, especially the younger audience might think, Oh, I'm mil- that will never happen to me. That's a million miles away from me. But it can happen on a 50 grand salary. It can happen in a UK tour. It doesn't need to be this astronomical UFC fighter or like it doesn't need to be Oasis or yeah. a huge band. It can happen at a very oh, macro level. And, and we live in a different world. The idea that I would be a millionaire was like non-existent. There was no, there was no internet when I was growing up. So there was no, you know horizons limitless expectations there was none of that so there was there was really and truly i never really wanted to make money with my music that wasn't even part of the the sphere of why i wanted to do it i wanted the fame status i i i wanted the adoration i want like i mean you think about back when i was a wee guy looking up at my dad and looking at these guys being like oh but i kind of wanted that almost i tried to achieve that i tried to be him but i tried to do it on a national scale rather than my dad did it in his own back garden. My dad didn't want people outside of his circle to know who he was because that invites trouble, you know, in the world that he lived in. Whereas I was like, I was like, I want everybody to know who I am. Um, I'm going to be bullish about it. But um, a 50 grand salary, I might, I might as well have been a billionaire in comparison to the world that I grew up in. You know, I mean, it wasn't even a 50 grand salary. It was a, it was a 20 grand salary. I made 40k in commission. There was one, you know, there was one September during student season I made nine grand in commission. And I'm just like, I'm balling. But um, I was sad. Was there, there was a, a sadness to it all. Was there like a hiatus where it like, was there a pivotal moment where you were like, I need to leave this matrix? Yes. Um, well, porn addiction reared its ugly head. I won't go into it too much because it's not really just my story because I had a girlfriend, but basically the circumstances around a relationship that I was in for nine and a half years meant that um, a highly sexual relationship ended up almost non-existent uh, due to circumstances. And if anybody really wants to, they could go back and try and fucking find a needle in a haystack. I have told that story, but it's her story it's no mine so i don't really want to tell it and i don't think it's fair for me to really go into that but basically i the combination of like a lack of sex in my relationship and high speed internet becoming you know and i got like a laptop and it was at that time where you know just before the iphone popped and uh, i took to porn to appease a high sex drive of which i have got just a part of my nature it's always been there and it's still there, you know, I'm nearly 40 and 
Um, I, I hear stories from my peers and I'm just like, I couldn't survive with that. Like, I need more than that. Um, but I could solve that. It's silly, but um, <laughs> the CBT coming in. But um, I, I led myself down a path with porn that was just not nice, not fun. And I woke up to it one day. I just Googled something that had happened. Like, I had experienced erectile dysfunction at like 31 and i went to google and put in 31 year old guy can i get hard on whatever can i get an erection and it was like how much porn do you watch and it was like <laughs> my head fucking shot it was like a fucking sniper bullet i was like fuck i'm daily multiple times a day and it was like you're a porn addict and i was like fuck me so that that was like it shook everything. It was like an earthquake. And did you marry the two? The, the lack of purpose, the unfulfillment in your job, and this addiction. Nah, at the time? no. At that point, I was still sleeping. Still, just like, oh fuck, it's just that, it's just this thing. Um, just what happened in the relationship. Not really realizing that I absolutely like my life at that time consisted of the gym every day, um, relentless at the gym, um, diet. You know, fucking chicken and broccoli and fucking protein shakes. That was pretty much tuna. It was this was all that I consumed. It was like tuna, turkey, chicken, steak, broccoli, rice, um, hot sauce, salt, and you know, water. That was my diet. Like, um, I'd have a cheat meal maybe every now and again. But um, so th- th- this was like gym, diet, porn, and nights out and work that was my full life that was it and it was a terrifyingly boring and hollow existence that i had no idea i I would just go to you know like if i had a saturday off i'd go and spend a grand on clothes easy easily like it was one one saturday afternoon where i got a two and a half grand ppi claim just randomly shoved into my bank account and i was like where the fuck is this Check my bank a lot, you know, very money orientated. They're like, where the fuck's this random two and a half grand came for? RBS refund, phoned the bank, RBS, they were like, oh, you took a couple of loans and we put PPI and it was just automatic payout. You don't need to do the claim. I'm just paying out. And I was like, oh, great. And went to Brayhead and spunked a lot of it on jeans, shoes, trainers, jackets, and shirts. It's like the, the addictions were everywhere. They were, I was like surrounded, but the main one that was impacting my life was porn. And we'll go back to, um, I've never looked back. I was like, that's it. I'm finished with it. Given, given the nature of a porn addiction, right? So alcoholism, right? You could, if you went to a pub with a mate, they could take a pint out of your hand and not allow you to drink. Or if you're smoking, they could hit the cigarette out of your hand. But porn is a very secretive, or like the hopes yeah. of a secretive oh, 100%. addiction. And yeah. no, one else, no one's going to save you but you. I watched and- a fair amount with my missus at the time, but obviously. But um, yeah, it was just, we were the only ones that knew about it. Like nobody else knew about it. So you essentially got sick of your own shit, essentially? No. There were physical ramifications to what was going on. And I have got a, a high sex drive. And as part of my makeup, it, it's always been there. And I was as soon as it impacted my sex life, I was like, right, I'm done. So was that that experience weird. led you on to see like learning CBT? Yeah, yeah. So I so from there I went to therapy. That literally the next day I was like, what do I do here? And Google was like psychosexual therapy. I googled psychosexual therapy Glasgow. I got a phone number. I was like, I had plenty of money, so I was just like, fuck it. This is what you need to do. This is what the internet's telling me to do. So I'm going to do it. Um. Give up the porn, start wanking. Easy, like with the diet and the the working out and self control was not an issue. What was an issue was education, what I was doing and how it was impacting me. As soon as I started to feel the impact, I was like, I'm done with it. So this is another thing I'm really thankful for is I never went down a dark hole with porn. Like if you know what happens with porn addiction, it's well documented now. It gets worse and worse and worse. I was on that journey. I wasn't there yet. You know, thankfully, I never looked at anything bestiality, child porn. I never got to that point. Um, But 
Uh, as soon as it started to really impact me, I was done with it. Same with alcohol, same with the drugs. As soon as I started to see this is going to take away from my life, done with it. Like, when something adds to my life, I'm fucking head into it. I go like, I'm like diving into a swimming pool. When something's taking the water out of the pool for me, I'm like, I'm very good at being like, right, I'm done with that. Um, and I see it as like a challenge. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling temptation. I'm like, I will. We'll fucking, because back to that, like, even with my exams, we'll fucking see. And I'm like that <laughs> with myself. Like, get up at five. Like, when I read the 5 a.m. club, of which I'm not an advocate. Like, I think these things are like wildly out of kilter and very much put feeds into sort of productivity addiction, achievement addiction, and, and the capitalist life of, you know, the relentless pursuit of happiness, which is not really, it's the rel- rel- the relentless pursuit of putting your body and mind on the line so that people can make fuck tons of money off of the back of you, especially if you're working class, right? Um, Because as much as I made a lot of money making sales, when I became a manager, I started to see P&L and I was like, why was I only making that amount of money if that was the amount of money that I was making for this fucking company and started to get really disillusioned with that as well. Um, but back to that, um, I, I just, I'm like, even with myself, if I read something and the thought comes into my head, I couldn't do that. I'm like, we'll fucking see. I mean, there's so I'll many parallels like, in your story that, so many like golden threads, but the one thing that makes me curious is that, like you said, you lean into these things that add to your life, right? CBT for you unlocked this new version of yourself. It cured you of something that was... Yeah, so I never did CBT, right? Okay. I did psychosexual Sorry. therapy, which was a Freudian-based, you know, and it was mind-blowing, you know? She was like, uh, how did you observe your mum and dad together and, and blah, 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 right? So it was a whole sort of discovery of the psyche and... I was like, why? I said to her session one, why do you keep asking me about my mum and dad? And she was like, well, knew nothing about and and knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about psychology, mental health, um, and that would be two thousand and fourteen, right? It's not that long ago, really. My life has changed. That that was a life changing experience for me because it, it opened up so much for me i spilt myself out like i didn't shy away from it i was crying my eyes out in these sessions with this woman she was complimenting me and being like so honest and i was just like i need to get the most out of this like i'm i've real i realized i've bottled all of this up my full life and i felt it and when that first session i felt like the fucking like popping the cork on champagne yeah like like, like a release and i went i said to her i was like i'll come tomorrow I come tomorrow and she's like no one a week right calm down and I was like back here waiting can I wait to get in my session can I do double sessions what can we do here and actually like after six sessions she was like we need to stop like this is it this is and I realize now as a therapist she's met all limitations I know what's happened I see the process I do it myself like she's been like I can't help you any further you maybe need to go and speak to somebody else who's got a different specialization, but I never really did. What I did do though, so where did CP, CBT, so what did, we'll, we'll quickly jump to, what inspired me to become a therapist? Well, well that's the question, because I, yeah. I hear when I've spoken to other therapists, they say that they get people in the doors benefit, benefiting broadly from therapy and say, oh, I think I would like to become a therapist. And the therapist thinks to themselves, they're a great person, but I hope to God they don't become a therapist. Right. Right? Uh-huh. But what was it about therapy for you that you didn't just want to be selfish with it, you wanted to go and practice it so you could help others? Yeah. So uh, I had my own therapeutic experience, which was beautiful, and I loved it. And it was only fucking six, eight sessions, and it was life-changing. I basically took her advice. She was like, what you need to do here is you need to just rebuild. So I took a grenade like that in my life. I was like, fuck this. I left my girlfriend at the time. I started, I rented out my flat, sold everything, and I moved up to the West End where I live now. So I just went, if I'm going to change, it's radical. And I did it. Um, and that's continued right up to this studio. The last piece of sort of like radical change that I did. So she's told me like, look, you need to leave this woman. I asked, she asked me 
would she be willing to come in for a session? And I asked her, and she said no. And I said to her, are you willing to support me through this mental health, you know, depression, this crisis, this addiction? She was like, no, I don't. And I was like, right. And I told the therapist, and she was like, you need to leave her. That would be my advice. Now, as a therapist today, I don't know if that's best practice, but that is what I fucking needed to hear. Because I, I was like, I don't think I can do it. And then guess what came into my head? Well, we'll fucking see. <laughs> and I just bit down on the gum shield and I just went, let's do this. No, it was the best thing for her. And when we did it, it was a, it was a, a mutual, you know, it, it wasn't like, I didn't go home and go, you I'm, know, walking out. I'm walking out. And she was like, please don't leave me. She was like, I think this is, we agreed on this. We stayed together for um, six months. To just see, let's just see, right? You know, it was like we can't afford to just leave, and we need to like unwind finances and all that stuff. So we did that through a process. Didn't really tell anybody. We told our close friends and family that we were breaking up, but we did it over a process. It's a really like lovely thing, actually. Like I helped her move it. She helped me move it. Um, we went round each other's houses for the months when we moved out. Each other, we would see each other every day. We were best mates. We were we loved each other. You had the experience of setting each other free, almost. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, but I went through a period of right. Let's be single. So I, I kind of revert. I spent a maybe a three to six month period where I reverted to type, and I basically just shagged everything and moved. I would just match on Tinder, sex the same day. I needed it. It was like a let's get rid of this. Let's get this fucking monkey off the back. During that period, I, I um, bonded quite a bit uh, Well, a, a gay woman who was, um, let's just say she was bisexual, right? She had her own reasons for that. Like men hadn't treated her well through her life. So she, you know, would only be in a relationship with, with women, but she liked sex with men. I think she was probably bisexual. Definitely was fucking bisexual, right? So me and her... Um, it's funny like I was like an old man you know I was like 33 she was like 23 and we kind of like needed each other and we only really ever seen each other like three or four times it was it was weird but we spent a lot of time like talking to each other and she opened my eyes to like social justice and what was actually going on in the world LGBTQ plus like actually I was like right really like what the fuck I'm so blind to this shit like Twitter really had me properly fucking boomed off and we weren't there in the same age as what we were. Things are progressing rapidly, you know what I mean? Like all these like trans rights. It was just beginning and I was interested and like, what is this? So she educated me on that. And I think I showed her what a nice guy could actually be where somebody actually cares about you and doesn't treat you like a piece of shit. So she started to get that bit of sort of confidence and maybe, you know, and um that was great. She had been sexually assaulted and I said to her, like, why don't you go and get therapy? And she was like, no, everybody's making 60, 70 grand. At this point, I was a, a, an upper management in Virgin and I was making, like, more money than the 50K, like, sales salary. I was making like, 60, 70, 80, 90. I think the best year I ever had in Virgin, I made 110K, which is probably more than my fucking mom and dad made in their entire life, you know, and even that's the tip of the iceberg of what you could make money-wise. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't wealthy, like, but... For sure, for where I came from, I was rich in, in that sense. Um, but she was like, no, everybody's got the money that you've got. And I was like, fuck, really? And she was like, and even still, it's not even that easy to find a therapist. And I was like, oh, fuck. And she said, you should become a therapist. And I was like, fuck, like, what? And she was like, no, I'm being serious. Like, such a, such a, you listen. She was like, I've never met a person. I've never met a man who, she's like, you're like an old man to me. She's like, I've never met somebody who's so curious and who's willing to listen to my perspective on stuff and not challenge it. And she's like, that, there's something about that. She's like, I feel very comfortable about you and I don't feel comfortable about many men. And I was like, right, okay. And I, and I just went, this might be what I'm looking for. This might be my way out of this career that I hate. I didn't like going to work, but... I'm smart, so I wangled my way not to do very much and make quite a lot of money. Um, but, you know, working from home and just being like, I could do that from home. Oh, yeah, go home. And I just go home and fuck about. <laughs> so I could do the work very quickly, not a lot of time, not a lot of dedication. So 
I basically from there was like, um, and I'll make this brief because I want to talk about like where I'm at right now. With it. I went back to uni, um, and I self funded it. Uh, I went back to uni, and that was it. You know, and the the real change for me came in 2020 during lockdown, where I had got my counselling qualifications. I was certified as a counsellor, a person-centred counsellor, and I listened to a podcast. Just as part of research, somebody said to me, you should listen to as many podcasts as you can. So I googled, like, what are the world's biggest mental health podcasts? And the Feeling Good podcast came up um, by a cognitive behavioural therapist called Dr. David Burns. And I listened to one, two, three, four. I listened to he's got like he's got hundreds. He's in like episode two fifty or maybe even more than that. Maybe in the three hundreds now. Don't know. Don't get that much a chance to really listen to it as intently as I did. And I was like, wow, like, this guy was doing live therapy on a podcast, and you could hear the change. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I don't want to counsel people. I don't. I do want to counsel people. I want to hear people's stories. But I want to be able to give people something that they can tangibly do with their life after I've heard their story. Because I never got that for this woman, other than leave your girlfriend, because she's not, she's clearly not in for the fight here. And you're going to need to, you're in a mental health crisis, you're going to need to fight. And um, from there, um, I've become certified in his therapy. There's five levels, right? There's like, I don't know how many level five, they're like masters. There's not many. I think there's like three or four of them, including him. Um, but I'm level three. And that's the highest level I can get to here. I would need to go to California and, and study in person at, at the Institute. And I've spent the last year studying um, under this genius. This guy's a genius. Like um, practicing his therapy and just watching it change lives and i read his book feeling great and i self-therapied myself with it because i knew there's an element to therapy that is talking and getting to know people and gaining trust i've got my own trust i trust myself at this point and i just sat down and i did the exercises in the book mate and it was like light bulb after light bulb was just going off in my head of like wow what the fuck the biggest moment I remember was like, um, I remember listening to him on one of his podcasts and it was like, he was fucking speaking to me. He was like, one of the biggest things that people can't do is failure. And I was like, in my head, like, well, mm -hmm. fuck, he knows me. <laughs> and he was like, here's my philosophy. It's like, fail as fast as you can. And I was like, I can't do that. I was just like, listening to this voice and going i'm i'm scared of even hearing that he was like fail as fast as you can okay. and I, I was like right well i don't know when he was like through this podcast at the end of it he went here's the best technique that i can give somebody for people that are saying i can't fail like there's a thing called the acceptance paradox and i was like okay i'm interested in this what's this and he was like it's a paradox because you accept everything about yourself that you don't like and all of the failures in your life you accept it and you just that's it and i was like right how did i do that and i can remember standing in kelvin grove park and going failing to become a rock star i accept that and there was like a gut something in my gut just went away and i was like i have freed myself of something here and i was just like the the relationship that I was in for 10 years i accept that i failed and that relationship just all went away. All the shame, all the anxiety, everything I felt about myself. Just every every beating that I gave out to somebody when I was young, I accept that. Every kicking that I took, which were many because I'm not a good fighter, right? I accept that. All that they are are lessons that get me to here. And I accept them because without them, I wouldn't be the person that I'm. And it was like a fucking weight just went. Whew. And I was doing it for myself. I was saying it to myself. And it was like instantaneous emotional change. 
and I was just like, I need to give this to other people, man. Um, and I'm still on that journey because I'm, I, I, I can't do it like David does, right? He's been doing therapy since the 60s. He gets people to come to get to these points within two, three hours of speaking to him. He's a genius, man. He's a fucking genius. And anybody that's out there that's like, you know, I'm looking for something really fucking good, self help, feeling great. Um, it's not going to, you're not going to end up a fucking billionaire by listening to it. But I'll tell you one thing that you will get inner peace because he's just, there's something about the work that he's done. He's, I think he's tried and failed so many times um, that he just knows the keys to the door. Uh, whatever the door is, he's just like, this is what you should do with that. that to the, how to unlock that in somebody. Um, and, mate, I can't even tell you like how how much that's changed my life, and he doesn't even know that. So, so you know what I mean? I spoke to him like twice, my fault. But like, and he's so in demand. Um, but he, he lays out the principles of like what is actually going on, and here's the harsh truth: it right. No matter what happens in your life, what causes human suffering are the thoughts that go through your mind. And that's it. The only difference between me and somebody else is how I think about stuff, and that's it. But they can change that because you can change the way that you think. So if you can change the way that you think, you can change the way that you feel. And that has just been proven to me time and time and time and time and time again because because my band had failed, I was calling myself a loser in my head. I lost. I didn't succeed. And I took all of that responsibility that was me. It was a personal failure of me that the music didn't suit the time that I had four other guys running about me that could have done something different as well as me. But I, once I stopped calling myself a loser for that failure in my life and actually just went, I accept it. I just, I, I've got no other choice but to accept this because it's been and gone and I don't have a time machine to go back and change it. That's impossible. So all that I can really do is accept that I failed that is true for a perspective but also what am i going to do differently if i'm ever in this like if i'm going to do something with my life because that's what i was really trying to do do something good with my life what do i do differently let's look back and go what were the actual mistakes that i made let's not go you failed and go you made mistakes what were the mistakes and i'd never done that i'd always run away from it i don't want to know Close that shit out. It's too hard for me to think about. When I finally accepted that, here's the here's the other great thing about acceptance. Don't make it an excuse to do nothing, right? David's got this thing where he goes, there is one thing that I won't accept, and it's only one thing. Doing nothing. Like, that is hell. Doing nothing is doing something. What, what do you mean by that? Doing nothing is actively making a choice. Yeah, it's the choice of um, nihilism, or you're giving up. You've gave up on yourself. Yeah, yeah, I, I get I, I, get that. It is doing something. It's a, it's a choice. So that's the one thing. That's the only thing that he's like, when I have a client or a, a, a pupil or a student, he's like, the only thing that I will not accept is that they do nothing with their life because it's hell. That is hell on earth. And I agree with that. I, when I was working at Virgin and I was making money, I felt like I was doing nothing. Even though I was doing something, I felt like I was doing nothing. It was like nothing to me. It didn't mean anything to me. So that, I love that. But um, when you accept the mistakes that you've made, you can fix that. If you berate yourself for the mistakes, there's no fixing that. You're just going to call yourself names and make the same mistakes over and over and over and over and over again. If you can actually just go, do you know what? It wasn't, a, wasn't that I lost. It was that I made, there was a flaw in what I did. What did I do? How am I going to do it differently the next time? Um, but see, try to convince people to do that. Oh, that's a fucker. That's a fucker. Um, because when you give yourself acceptance, what can follow is a period of plateau. Yeah. But you need that plateau so that you know where you're going in life is actually where you want to go, rather than just letting the momentum just carry you away through your life. Given your story is like the embodiment of that brought to life, 
Where are you? Where are you now? Just loving, mate. Like, what? What do you mean? At what? At, at uh, what inner aspect? peace. Oh, mate. Like, in terms of your inner every day's a roller coaster, just the same as anybody else. But the, um, I don't. So I lived. I don't have fight or flight. I don't live in fight or flight. I choose the stress. Right, like so. The studio, I choose the stress. So if you, if you, if um, what's how did how did I put this right? The best quote I heard on this was that a dream life is not a life without problems. It's a life with problems that you want to solve. A hundred percent, mate. That's it. I've if you if you come to me and you're like, dude, I've got a big deadline. Like I need, like, um, I I go into here. Let's go. And I and I let my fight or flight kick on and I use it and then I let it die down and I let it go away. So um that that's took a long time. I mean, I, uh, I've been uh, I've been working on my mental health since twenty what did I say? I figured it out mathematically, but twenty sixteen. So I've been working on myself um and going through peaks and troughs and that from that period until now but see the last year it's been like magic because i've got my own way finally just accepted that i am who i am this is a thing right this this frustrates me right and i know that my own personal frustration stems for the fact that i think i've made a lot of these mistakes myself in the past and when i see other people doing it ultimately i care about them so i'm like don't do that but sometimes it comes out in frustration and anger and a bit of resentment and stuff. I watch everybody around about me try to be a one percenter. See if they all succeed. They'll be a hundred percenter. Mm-hmm. So what are we doing? Like, it's this hustle culture, grind. Don't need to do it, man. Don't need to do it. You can get to where you want to be without that stress. You can have everything that you want if you take your foot off the gas and you just allow yourself to do it rather than try and force yourself to do it you can do the same shit like i still go to the gym every day but do i do i hate on myself if i have a shit workout absolutely not why would i do that but see 10 years ago mate i used to come at the gym and be like fuck's sake Mm. for fuck's sake like i did five reps 30 kilogram or what would that be 30 60 and the bars 20 80 what fucking i just failed at an 80 kilogram fucking bench press i wanted to day three and i did two right and i used to come out the gym and be like fuck see next week i'm fucking getting it. i'm fucking getting it. see now i'm like what difference does that make to me what, what why am i going to the gym to be healthy does doing that extra rep make me more healthy than what it did or not no it doesn't it doesn't it but that doesn't take away the value of exercise and and um and actually like progressive continuous overload and continuous improvement all of that all of the all of the gold that sits in the pot of that is there but people rob themselves of it because they stress about they stress about it or they want more gold in the pot or, or they, they compare to other people's pot of gold 100 percent, which is like the worst fucking thing that you could ever do in your life both ways by the way right because I spent many years of my life shooting down because all my mates run about me didn't make the same amount of money and hadn't got the achievements that I had had in my life and I felt good about myself. But it allows you to do nothing. It allows you to fuck about. It allows you to go out and take coke and go and spend a grand and you because you're like, whatever, I've got more money. Than that. You know, like that comparison can go both ways. Um, I don't... I don't compare myself to anybody. I get so many people that come through this door and they'll be like, have you seen that podcast studio that's opened up down the road? And I'm just like, nope. And I have seen it. I just refuse to engage it. I just, oh, just ignore it. Because I sit and I look, and I'm like, how many podcasts does he get in the day? And I'll look at the promos that he's doing and blah, blah. I don't give a fuck. I'm just going to live my life the way that I want to live it and do it at my own pace and I'll get there. Um, but... That comes back to the cognitive behavioral techniques that I've learned through studying with David. Another thing that he does is we do um, personal work. So 
confidentiality is huge. So if I'm working with a client, can I really go and present that in a group? You can do it anonymously, which is great. But the better thing that you can do is take your own shit. <laughs> take your own shit to the toilet. Let's just go there and there's people that are there studying at Stanford and Ivy League school and they're there and they want to be good. And I'm like, here's my problem. And they're like, let's try and unpick and we date together. And it's personal work and we do it peer to peer. Um, and we fail every week, but we fail gloriously. It's like a glorious failure, like because it's a revelation almost. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll fucking get there. Like we'll we'll do it one way or another. What what David's doing is not CBT. It uses the CBT techniques, but ultimately, it, it's a therapeutic framework that you can then, at the last stage where you actually do work with people, which comes after getting to know them and and he, he, all this sort of you know, agenda setting and all that sort of stuff. You can do what you like. It gives you the freedom to do what you like. There's hypnotherapists, um, all sorts of therapists um, go and study under David. It's a, it's a framework for therapy. It's not a modality like cognitive behavioral therapy. That's his chosen modality. And he'll teach you the techniques at the end, which I've learned. But ultimately, what I'm doing next, I'm level three. I'm not moving to California. That's for fucking sure. Um, I wouldn't want to live in America anyway, but um, what comes next for me is pr- what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and learn another modality because I've already learned three. I've got uh, person-centered counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, and EMDR, which is helps people with trauma. So I'm going to go into, I'm going to learn another modality so that I've got this mammoth toolkit that's what that I can just grab. And just bring stuff in depending on what the person presents to me because you need to treat people and what they present no dogmatism and like this is what's going to heal you we don't know what will heal you for me it was a fucking book and a podcast and stonin's kelvin grove park <laughs> so you don't know what will heal you you don't know you just need to go and try whatever and and you'll hopefully you'll fucking find out i mean i have i'm privileged to actually have this space and the trust for you to like give me that whole roadmap of so many different flavors and I, I i guess it's such a cliched question right but if you knew what you knew know now all the techniques and the life experiences that you've had mm-hmm. through such a turbulent life you could go back to paul who's just finished his six year or is in six year at school was there anything that, that really stands out i would go back further, further? i think yeah when do you think he needs someone like you? Yeah, I think... Um, not like me, right? But compassion, empathy, and, and maybe like a bit of guidance. Um, I would say probably sort of like that sort of teenage, sort of 12, 13. Um, and I would... I'll tell you what I would say to him. I'd just be like... Everything will work out. You don't need to worry. That would be it, really. I'd, I'd just put a hand on your shoulder and just be like, don't worry about it, man. See all the rejection and all the stuff that you don't get, you you know, like um, being a fat kid and, and like feeling kind of um, incompetent and unworthy and, and none of that matters. It's all bullshit, actually. Like, just let go of it. Just free yourself of it. I think I'd like to just sit down and teach them how to fucking do that. But (laughs) here's another sort of kicker for it. I don't know if I would have accepted it. I don't know if I would have been like, you don't know me, man. Like, My dad knows me. I'm going to do what he does. uh I I trust him more than I trust you. I trusted him more than I trusted anybody on this fucking planet. Right up until, you know... I became the man of the house, you know what I mean? Like when he when he was really sick. Um so I don't know if I would have accepted that. But um if I had went back to six year, I don't know if I would say anything. I, I I would just like I would just like to have comforted that sort of teenage boy that decided that he had to try and prove himself to everybody at every twist and turn. See the guy at sort of six year, I don't think I would say anything because it would be like that butterfly effect. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know what would happen. I don't know what... If I didn't wake up at 31 
I could have ended up in an unhappy relationship for the rest of my life. Fuck that, dude. Fuck that. Like, I would rather be hand to mouth working in a uh, Costa Coffee. I'm not talking that down, right? But service industry work, hand to mouth, happy than what I would be Elon Musk and miserable. This is the other thing that I think I've came to realize that anybody that takes more than what they need is unhappy because you don't need it so why are you taking it's fulfilling it? something else it's like status signaling it's doing something else for you and which validity. look i have made money through this studio and i make money right and um thankfully like at a position now where i'm almost at like that sort of i'm at a transitional period right because the whole goal was get myself to the place where um I've got the amount of money that I had when I get made redundant in my bank and my bank as lit savings, not to invest in because I invested that in courses. I bought all the equipment for the studio. So that went, you know, that went, <laughs> you know, I ended up down at the sort of 5k mark and I was like, right, this is squeaky bum time. Like, and it put, my, put myself into a sort of pressure point to be like, I need this pressure because I need to change and I need to be in business and I've never done it before. I finally got myself, like, sort of just the tail end of Christmas last year. Um, got to a point where I'm like, I've now got that amount of money in my bank as savings, and I've got a business that's just mine, and, you know, it doesn't really cost me any money and, and, and all that sort of stuff. But that safety net that's in there, that's all that I need. So now I'm like, what do I do? And I'm like... I'm going to invest. So I've got a mate that we're talking about maybe starting a business and I've got the wee sort of voice in my head going, no, but another another 10K in the bank would make you feel even more comfortable. And I'm like, I don't need that. <laughs> I don't need that. So I'm going to give back to some people. I'm going to start being like, to, to I'm going to just give people capital. I'm not going to get involved in a business that fucking spray paints cars. I know fuck all about that, right? So he needs it. Um, and I'm like, let's do it. And I'll just give you the money and I'll let you run the business and we'll, we'll work it out. So that's, I think that's maybe going to be the next phase is where I just start to do investment. But not in like crypto or stocks and shares or Fortex. Or, I'm going to invest in people. I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to do it right. I'm not going to try, I'm not going to, try and do it to make myself rich. I want to make everybody run about me comfortable and then we'll see where we're at. We'll see what happens from there. Because once I'm at that point, then it'll be, well, what do I need? Like, what, what do I need here? Like, I've got my missus. I'm in love with her. What at seven years. Oh, well I don't think I, I could have ever imagined that. I always thought, hmm, always kind of dies around about the five-year mark <laughs> or something like that. Um, I've got that. I've got my purpose. I'm expanding my myself through learning and I and I now value that. I stopped that for a long time. I mean, I would learn how to sell and but all that kind of came naturally to me. I'd learn how to work the phones with but the blah blah blah. But it was all about selling stuff to people. I'm now just learning. Um something beautiful happened about two years ago. I picked my guitar up for the first time in I don't know, like five years. And um started just playing for the fun of it aye so what, did, what what more do i need like what i'm i'm fighting the resistance to be like expand like expand this i'm fighting against that because i think we've got a human instinct to be like a wee bit more yeah. give me a wee bit more but i know that feeling and i felt that sort of like and and like I said, I'm I'm sort of spitballing this idea in my head that's going round every time I'm sort of giving myself an hour to think about it where I'm like, it's time to expand in a different way though. And I think the way that I'm going to do it is like I said, I'm going to invest in my mates. And I'm going to give them the opportunity. Like the reason that this came up was I was talking to one of my mates and I was and we were a wee bit drunk and I was like, You just need to date, man. You just need to go all in on it. Like just that's what I've done. Yeah. And he went, I bet you get a big redundancy. And I was like, fuck, right. Wow, right. Aye, I did. And he was like, and he was like, no taking away from the fact of what you've done with that money, but you need that money. 
He was like, I don't have that money and I've got a mortgage and I've got a kid. And I think that sparked a like, right, no, we, no, it's about, can I make enough money to give them that opportunity? And if they fail, oh, I'm gambling with money, it's, you know, I don't need that, so fuck it. For me, there's a golden thread that ties all that together. Like through the podcast studio, you have people coming in and you're in helping them unlock something within them. Through therapy, you're helping people unlock things within themselves. And then through this new model, this new phase, you're going to help people unlock something as well. And that seems like the golden thread, like helping people unlock their potential through different types of medium seems like what what's next mm, for you. If yeah. I were to kind of summarize sum that, try and sum that story up that we've just sat in and in, in um, I may, I think that when I do stuff for other people, it usually ends well. When I think about myself solely, it never really ends well. It kind of always becomes dysfunctional quickly or not so quickly. That seems to be what I've learned a lot about is like when you're self-centered, when it's about you, um, it, it just doesn't seem to go as well. And even if it doesn't go as well, which things have, right? But I think I would probably feel a lot better about it, even if I, it didn't go well. I'm always just like, well, you know, I'm doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. And I think that's important to me. Um, morality was another thing that my dad would... That was the biggest thing that he instilled in me. I always say this when I talk about him. To think about a guy that was born in 45 and was, like, not racist, not homophobic, not bigoted in any way, shape, or form, it's actually quite remarkable. I don't meet very many people... I never really met guys his age that are really like that. They always had a wee bit of something, a wee niggle, like a wee bit of bigotry, a wee bit of racism, especially considering that my dad owned, you know, when the inf influx of immigration for places like Pakistan and happened in the 70s and things like the National Front became a thing and, the e and then later times EDL and, you know, like he never gave into it. He never ever gave into that sort of lowest rung on the ladder of like ra things that he didn't understand that caused fear in people that caused them to be, you know, like homophobic or race. I don't understand what the fuck's going on here and blah, blah, blah. He never gave into it. He was just pure, they're a human being. You think about, I became a therapist and human centered, humanistic, really my outlook in life. My dad would just always say to me, I remember one time, we can sort of like close it up on this because it has been a sort of st a story of my thing maybe him and then sort of changing that. Uh, we um, and I don't mean this to be triggering, by the way, with a trigger warning. I'm going to be a bit racist here. I'm not going to say any sort of like language. Like I'm not going to say any N word or anything like that. But um, my dad had a disagreement with a guy that owned the shop at the end of the street because he was parking his car on the curb. And he was just like, can I fucking park? <laughs> right? And just like being a fucking, just gain him it. Like, fucking get your motor off the curb. And we went to the bus stop. And I think I must have been about eight or nine year old. And I went, I go, he lives in a tree anyway. And my dad was just like, don't you fucking dare say that. And I was just like, well, oh, but I'd heard that. I'd heard that for like monkles and like guys at school about people that were black and brown and Indian and, and whatever. And he said to me, and this is just this stuck with me in my mind where he just went, that's a human being. And I was just like, right. And he went, and your grandpa came here as an Irish immigrant and get called a dog and get spat on in the street. He's like, so don't you ever fucking dare do that to anybody else. And I was just like, right, okay. And that was, a, that, that was a guy that grew up in, in a time of racism and a time of rampant homophobia. So he was a wee bit of an outlier in that. Um, and it, and it put that it put that seed in me to just be like, no matter what happens, when you meet people, you meet a human first. And then all the rest of it that sits behind it, well, we can deal with that later. And I think that while I was in the band, and when I talk about that story about spitting in the guys, I think I lost that a wee bit. And when I went into sales, I lost my faith in humanity because when you work in service industry, you get abused and you start to kind of hate the general public. And I kind of think I lost that in the saucy of that. And then I found it again when um, I met my therapist and then ultimately I started to meet people through dating and, and meeting different types of people and started to realise, right, fuck, get back to this sort of like treating people as human beings first and then the rest of it can come after that.
um, and it's served me well recently, you know, in my recent life. That's what I do with people. Like we we're talking about earlier, this guy's different. This guy's different. This guy's different. How do you relate? You know, I've been asked that by a, a close mate, where he's like, I don't know how you sit and um, in a room with people that are sitting talking about things where you're just like, I disagree with that. And just like, because they're, they're human. Human being. That's it. That's the, the not the end of the, the rope, mate. Mm-hmm. What a way to wrap it up. Like, that went full circle, essentially. Didn't um, even mean that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> this was all scripted, mate. <laughs> mate, if the people want to engage in your work, whether it's a podcast, whether it's the studio, whether it's uh, therapy, where can they find you? If if you just, I mean, I've got like socials for the studio and stuff, but just come to my social media. Just go straight to it. See if you send me a message. I promise I'll look at it at least. Right? <laughs> What's the username? Do you know? I might not reply. No, I will. I'll, I'll usually reply to people. If, if it's mental health related, uh, you'll hundred percent get a fucking reply for me. Um, it's at Rebel City Paul. You can go back and listen to my podcast, but you know my views. The more people I meet, the more my views change on stuff. So sometimes you'll probably hear stuff that I would have said back, started Rebel City in 2017, the tail end of 2016. You'll probably hear me say stuff, you'll be like, doesn't sound like the same guy. Stuff like that. Fucking, I'm constantly growing and my mindset and my view on the world and on people is constantly shifting. So I, I changed my mind. Um, I, I, a talent that I think a lot, not a lot of people have in 2022 mm-hmm. just change your fucking mind just be like oh shit i was wrong <laughs> i accept that um but i mate, it's a pleasure i'll link everything in the show notes mate this is a pleasure like i said reached out to you ages ago because we've been friends and i've heard snippets of your story and it's honestly a real privilege to just lace all together it's been amazing thank you very much for having me mate